בוקר טוב. Good morning, good morning one and all. I would first of all like to thank the head of the INSS, Mr. Yadlin, Frank Lowy, and all of the distinguished guests who have come here this morning to the annual INSS conference, which is so important. First of all, happy Tu Bishvat. It is the holiday of the trees here in Israel. We are celebrating growth, we are celebrating renewal, blooming, and it's certainly a good time of year to be talking about the new challenges, the new national security challenges Israel is facing. And I must say that I've read that this conference today, this year, is celebrating the 70th anniversary of the State of Israel, and I've certainly tried to think what can we actually say that is new beyond those things that we all know very well. Because when we talk about national security, and I see a few people here in the room that are very experienced, much more than I, in this matter, then what, we usually, what usually comes to mind when it, we talk about national security is, of course, the IDF, the Ministry of Internal Security, the many challenges we have in this region. But I thought to myself that for this issue, you don't need to mention time and again these things because we can say those things in just a minute. I'm certain that you've heard a lot already about Iran and how it is trying to make itself established in Syria, and that it's a red line, that we shouldn't allow Iran to attain a nuclear weapon and the threat of uh, Hezbollah getting armed, and that is pretty much uh, the national security challenges that we all think about when we talk about national security. But what is good to do, and it's good that the INSS is doing, is also to look for those challenges that are new and impact our national security and sometimes even no less than others, but that we have not internalized the need to cope with enough. And what am I referring to? I am referring very much to those challenges that are currently under the responsibility of my ministries, the Ministry of Internal Security, and strategic affairs and information. And when we look at national security and the equation for national security, then for several decades we are surprised time and again. Because if we look around and if we were to admit it, and we've talked about these challenges and threats, there is no immediate, imminent existential threat to the State of Israel. There is no foreign army around us. And I'm not talking about Iran in the longer term. And there's no foreign army around us that wants to occupy and conquer the state of Israel and annihilate it as was in the past. What are our enemies focusing on? And we are surprised by that time and again by this challenge. They are focusing on what they think is our soft spot here in Israel, our Achilles heel, which is the home front, the centers of towns. It began with Saddam Hussein and the Gulf War and how the Scud missiles were uh, launched at Tel Aviv, and there was also the suicide bombers of Arafat in the 1990s, followed by, after the uh, unilateral withdrawal from Lebanon, the thousands of rockets and missiles that reached mostly Israel's northern part, and following the withdrawal from Gaza, Hamas and its terror tunnels and its rocket and missile launches, all at the home front. And if we look at recent years, then when we look at what has changed about these threats to the home front in recent years, then we can see two main threats that are more prominent and have changed things, not only in Israel, but around the world. The first threat is, of course, the terror of individuals 
the lone wolves, so to speak. And the second threat is the delegitimization, or as we call it around the world and in Israel, the BDS movement. And what has given the new weapon that has changed this state of affairs and has allowed for these threats, and I haven't come up to this uh, stage with it, but you all ha have it in your pocket, I assume. The new weapon is, of course, our mobile phone and the internet infrastructure. And this challenge we're only beginning to understand, but certainly we have yet to internalize it with respect to our national security and our ability to build the necessary powers and forces in order to grapple with these threats that have taken place. And why did that change the maps, the threat map? I think that the terror attacks around the world and also the terror attack waves of the lone wolves that began here in Israel about three years ago demonstrated well. Because if in the past, we needed to get to the university or to go to a school or to get to a village, a Palestinian village, in order to try and recruit and convince the next terrorist and then to train them and to equip them and then to send them off to be a suicide bomber. And then our intelligence organizations, whether it's uh, the IDF intelligence or the ISA or Mossad, had to do their work and they tried to thwart this terror attack by following the main activists involved, then today it is a completely different kind of terror, and the terrorist's profile is completely different, because these days you don't need to go through this whole process. Now, thanks to the mobile phone and the internet, we can incite, we can make religious uh, extremism more popular, we can speak to the hearts and minds, of people and try to convince them based on this incitement to go out and carry out terror attacks. And of course, these attacks are done using very basic uh, weapons such as a kitchen knife or even using the car to run people over or um, setting places on fire. And that, of course, places a new threat that alongside missiles and rockets, which we are well aware of, this is a new threat. And when we think about who is supposed to provide a response to all of these scenarios that focus on the home front, then what can we do? It is not the IDF. Yes, it's true, there is the Home Front Command, but at the end of the day, the IDF's ability to meet these threats and that are designed to intimidate and frighten the civilians and make them think that perhaps their future is not here in Israel, these threats must be addressed by the Ministry of the of Public Security, by the Israeli police force, by the firefighters here in Israel, by the volunteers and civilians. And in these contexts, certainly, we have yet to go a longer road in order to internalize this challenge and in order to grapple with it. What did we do? Because in recent years we have done a lot and there have been very significant accomplishments and achievements. Understanding that the heart of the dispute between us and the Palestinians has been and has remained Jerusalem, Israel's capital and the holy sites, because at the end of the day, and if you don't want to understand it, then you're ignoring reality. This conflict is not about territory, or certainly not only about territory, it is still primarily a religious conflict. And when we understand that Jerusalem, Temple Mount, and it is no um, surprise that that is where the terror wave began, that is the heart of the conflict, then the way that we prepare ourselves and the way that we conduct ourselves at the Israeli uh, police force 
Their ability to cope with terror attacks must begin in Jerusalem, and we have in recent years carried out dramatic changes there that in my eyes will turn Jerusalem into one of the safest cities in the world, if not the safest. And we're talking about greater police forces, more than 1,000 officers in sensitive points. We're talking about investing in the most advanced technologies available in the world that have networked Jerusalem with thousands of advanced advanced cameras and a very big visual intelligence center now being set up at Gilo, uh, southern neighborhood of Jerusalem. And this has to do also with the use of mobile phones and our ability to incite 24-7 from anywhere to anywhere. We therefore are focusing primarily on the Israel police force's ability to monitor the social media and to reach the terrorists by profiling them together with the Shabbat, the ISA, Israel Security Agency, and to arrest them even before they have become extreme all the way through and go out to carry out the terrorist attack. In this context, I can mention, perhaps you didn't understand exactly at the beginning why I am so critical of Mark Zuckerberg and uh, Facebook and the responsibility of the large internet companies not only to enjoy the profits they are making, and I hope that they make a lot of profit, good for them, but also to take responsibility over the incitement that is going wild on their platforms and not just to wait for the police force or the the ISA or the Ministry of Justice to, um, to contact them, but rather to actively monitor their own platforms and to clear them of any messages that cross the red lines or are illegal. And in this context of incitement, and again, I have to say that when we talk about an era of lone wolf terrorists, the incitement and disbursement of ideology and lies and radical, murderous ideology, that is one of the things that we must internalize and change dramatically our approach to and to have zero tolerance for such incitement. And so, after many years, where organizations who are inciting, like the Amorabitun and the Morabitat, who have really ignited everything that's going on on Temple Mount, or the northern faction of the Islamic movement headed by Ra'id Salah, then finally, after many years, where we didn't just talk about working against these organizations, but we have actually made them outlaws, which allowed the Israel police force to work against them more prominently. And the activity of these inciting organizations, not only in Jerusalem, but throughout Israel, has decreased dramatically. And so our focus was first and foremost to intensify the police force's abilities in sensitive areas, particularly in Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, and in the holy sites. We are setting up a new unit now for Temple Mount. And the second area, and I know that there was a panel before me this morning, the second area is focusing on the challenges of reinforcement and law-abiding um, Arab citizens. And I'm not blaming the Arab citizens of Israel. Historically, there are 20% of, this, of our population that are Arab. And by the way, that is something that is also apparent in other places around the world. We see in Belgium and France entire neighborhoods that are completely disconnected from the rest of the citizens or from government services. And when we understand that, we, that living in our midst are millions of civilians with equal rights who barely see the police in their daily lives, we understand that there is a security and national challenge here because these young people who are living in an atmosphere where there is no culture of abiding laws, then obviously it is much easier to incite them later and to recruit them later and to take them to far worse places. And let us not be surprised afterwards that we discover another unit or another link of uh, young people in Umm al-Fakhim who identify with this ideology and who plan terrorist attacks. It is our responsibility
responsibility as the Israeli government to provide civil police services to all of these millions of citizens. And that is perhaps the second area in which I have done a lot and the government has done a lot in order to change what happened in the last few, de uh, few decades and to provide a much better solution to the challenges of reinforcement, of law enforcement, uh, and of law abiding, and that because that because they have a significant impact on all of the challenges of the home front. Because in fact, all our enemies are focusing on these days is to uh, hit our Achilles heel, as they understand it, which is the citizens living in city centers in Israel. Another challenge which I think we have not internalized enough and have not focused on properly in recent decades and celebrating our 70th anniversary it is time to understand has to do with issues that this conference discussed and have been mentioned. For instance, our relations with the world jury with the Jews in the United States and the delegitimization challenge and combating and countering BDS. And yes, it is nothing new. All sorts of attempts to ban Israel have happened in the past, but once the, techno the technology has improved and it is now easier to disperse these lies throughout the world using the internet, once millions and hundreds of millions of people around the world are exposed to a pro-Palestinian network that is designed to delegitimize the state of Israel as a Jewish state, now we are at a point where we are under strategic threat. We may be, lo we may be losing our leadership, we may be losing the new leaders that these young people could have become in the free world, and we may find ourselves at a certain point in time battling for the legitimacy of Israel as a Jewish state. And we have seen since the Durban Convention, that the use of these tools is ever growing. In the last two years, there has been a turning point in a negative sense that has been manifest in the decision made by President Obama 2334, whereby you can differentiate between the way Israel is treated and the way Judea and Samaria is treated, or anything that is beyond the green line. And the second characteristic that has impacted the activity against us as part of the delegitimization and BDS campaign is, of course, the uh, Abu Mazen's uh, refusal to negotiate with Israel. And when there is stagnation in the political arena, then obviously there will be initiatives in this area whereby Israel should be legitimized. And when Abu Mazen now understands that he is currently in his twilight zone, I think we all realize that when we see that he is making, taking more and more steps to internationalize uh, this uh, uh, conflict, when in the past it was international organizations who were behind the BDS, and now we see the Palestinian organizations, such as advancing the blacklist in the UN and other such uh, initiatives against Israel, then this challenge becomes of a larger scale, and we must not uh, ignore it. And indeed, we have not ignored it. First of all, again, it's the first time since the establishment of the State of Israel that a ministry has been set up, which I am heading, and the aim of which is to advance this entire counter campaign against the BDS. It's the first time that a budget has been given to it. Of course, it's insufficient. It is never sufficient. But there's much more than ever before. And we already see the accomplishments and achievements of this counter campaign. We have finally internalized the threat and its dangers to Israel. 
and we are already seeing the wonderful and huge achievement that our counter campaign has brought about. And I can mention dozens of states in the United States that have already passed laws against BDS, and countries in Europe that have also passed resolutions, including courts of law that have passed uh, laws against BDS. However, it is still not enough, and we must, as I've said, when it comes to the new technologies and when it comes to these threats that our rivals and enemies are trying to advance and promote against us, then we must internalize and realize that the investment that the State of Israel should be making into strategic threats is not only in the IDF, but also belongs to the areas of investing in civil uh, factors such as firefighters, police officers, volunteer organizations, the civic society organizations in Israel, and some of these efforts should also be to spread the truth about Israel and to expose the big lies that is behind that are behind BDS, their connections to terror organizations and terrorists. That's also another thing that we have been focusing on this last 12 months to make Israel more accessible and to make those opinion shapers uh, come here, not only Jews as part of birthright, but from all other sectors, from all public opinion makers in uh, around the world and Europe, and that's what we've been doing. And the final point, and with that I will conclude, is the political issue and our relations with the Palestinians. Again, I will once again reiterate that Abu Mazen is currently in his twilight zone, in his last days, so to speak. Uh, you can see that in his activity, in his extremism, in his addresses, in his delegitimization of the State of Israel. And I think that when we celebrate our 70th anniversary, it is time for us to not only speak about new paradigms, not only internalize the fact that all paradigms or all the past ways of thinking have actually um, gone bankrupt, have actually uh, are actually out of business, but to actually take steps on the ground that, that will change the balance, that will change the considerations of the next Palestinian leadership that will grow and replace Abu Mazen when his time is up. And now that we've heard throughout the years, time and again, we're surprised the time it was Barak, when Barak was prime minister, when Omar was prime minister, that when the Palestinians get the money time, at the end of the day, they prefer to run away from the negotiation table, assuming, and I think that we've heard it many times, that time is against Israel. And if time is against Israel, then each and every one of us, if they were to negotiate over their biggest assets, and they think that time is working against their adversary, then naturally that's what you would do. You would leave the table and wait for more time to go past, because then perhaps the conditions when they return to the table will be better, or the terms will be better. And I think that what is now happening is starting to change the way we think, and it's still not enough. We are in the Trump era. We are in an era where we don't only need to talk about politically correct, we can also talk about what is just correct, because we all know that President Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel didn't change things on the ground. It only demonstrated and showed the Palestinians that their refusal will make them pay a heavy price of recognizing the truth, of acknowledging reality, of recognizing processes that we know clearly how they should end. So I think that this policy of stopping to talk in a politically correct manner, but rather do what is good, 
correct and what is right and by that to convey a message to the Palestinians the time is not only against Israel we'd all like to achieve peace we all understand that as time goes by the populations both in Israel and in the Palestinian Authority are suffering and are unable to thrive and to succeed and to live a better life but time is not only working against Israel. Israel is strong and safe in its 70th year and the time that is going by will also be against the Palestinians and primarily so because facts will be made on the ground. And these facts won't only be made in terms of recognizing the truth and reality that Jerusalem is Israel's capital. But today, for instance, we have the chance, I think it is a real chance, not only to declare that the Golan Heights will forever be a part of the state of Israel, but now, when we are at an age where Syria is being divided again, and when Daesh, ISIS as a territorial factor in the entire world has seen and internalized the threats in Syria and understands that it will be many years before it will be stable, I think now we have a real chance with the US administration to also get de facto recognition of Israel's sovereignty in the Golan Heights, just as we have been given in Jerusalem. The same exact thing can be said about what's happening with the UNRWA, and we all know that its activity does not promote peace, but rather makes it further and further away. And it also has to do with the uh, strange idea of uh, having all of these uh, generations of refugees come back. And the same is true for the Taylor Force law and the fact that we have yet to completely stop budgeting. And we're actually really just financing terror when it comes to the Palestinian Authority and what they give to Palestinians who kill innocent citizens and yes, even when we're talking about annexing unilaterally C area C, we all know that at the end of a political process, at the end of a peace process, it doesn't matter with which Israeli or Palestinian leadership, the settlement blocs like Ariel, Ma'ale Adumim and Gush Etzion will remain forever in under Israeli sovereignty. So why wait? Why discriminate against the Jewish people living there by law and allow them to live under Ottoman or Jordanian laws because we have a Palestinian leadership across the table that is refusing to sit at the negotiations table and talk about mutual concessions. I certainly believe, despite traditional thinking, despite the paradigms that we have gotten used to, that if we were to shatter in our 70th anniversary all of these paradigms, if we were to leverage and to make good use of these very strong and bold alliances that we have made much stronger with many countries, and if we were to, to explain to them and convince them that all of our old ways have failed, and just a moment before Abu Mazen's successor comes, he should understand that it is in his best interest to sit immediately to the negotiations table and have a rapid round of negotiations with Israel's leadership, if that is, will not happen, then we have to stop talking politically correct and rather go ahead with our truth and continue to strengthen and bolster the state of Israel and its alliances with all of its friends and those who will be the big losers at the end of the day will be the Palestinians. We want peace, but in order to attain peace, we need two sides, and we cannot do it unilaterally. That is the message I would like to convey. Thank you.